Welcome to episode 63 of Alt Drift X's Game of Thrones Abridged. This is another uh, impromptu episode coming at you when you least expect it. Out of the shadows to hit you with some uh, finely condensed literary insight all up in your up up in your eye holes, mostly your ear holes, uh, because this is an audio uh, audio uh, show, mostly putting the audio back in audio visual. That's what Alt Drift X is all about. Welcome all to the chat. File in neatly. Take a seat and let's bask in the wonders of this chapter of Game of Thrones. This wonderful chapter called Tyrion V. I, 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 as soon as the, the Roman numerals, man, there's too many of them. They're like picket fences with all the vertical slats. How did the Romans not think, man, there's got to be a, there's got to be a more, there's got to be a more efficient way to say eight. Can't we find a way to say eight that doesn't require th- four separate digits. C- is there no possible way we can figure that out? What did the Romans ever do for us? They got the aqueducts. They got the cities. They got the lead pipes. They got the, 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 um, who were those blokes who, the lectors who carried those sticks around? You know, in ancient Rome, you know, the ostensible pinnacle of, of ancient Western civilization, you know, they literally had blokes whose whole job it was uh, to carry bundles of sticks around. Uh, the, the old, the literal faggots, I believe they might be called. And, and and these bundles of sticks indicated the status and importance of the official or bureaucrat or or, or leader who, who was being followed by these blokes. It, I might, again, might be making this up. Correct me in the comments, but, but like a lictor or a lector, I think they were called, blokes whose job it was to carry sticks. So, of course, as ever, this, 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 this show will be uh, strictly adhering to the railroad tracks. We will be staying on point and we'll be adhering to the text because we've got some important stuff to get through, guys. We've got some important content. Tyrion is facing uh, physical danger uh, in a way that he has not before. Tyrion's gone through quite a lot uh, actually, in his recent chapters, what with being accused of all these random murders that he didn't do, uh, traversing the high road twice, dealing with a Tully twice, two of them, two trouts, the 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 the, the wolf fish and the and the bird fish, Lysa and Catelyn, and now Tyrion faces yet another challenge because he's going to get himself caught up in a little bit of little bit of war. A little bit of a battle, a little bit of the old medieval scuffle, bit of a tussle, you know, a bit of the old roll in the hay, except the hay is uh, mortal combat and the rolling is uh, the dance of death uh, called fighting. That's that's kind of what's going on. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> man, the whole gang's here. I'm I'm seeing uh, I'm seeing. Uh, Stephanie Morris, I'm seeing Hairless Oyster, I'm seeing Amy Bennett, I'm seeing Ricky Holmberg. You're all, you've all made it somehow, despite the completely unannounced episode. Uh, that's pretty impressive. Welcome all for turning up, and let's get right into this chapter, because it's rather a long one. It's rather, I mean, not a huge one, but it is, you know, listen to these pages. Uh, look, you hear that? It's Russell Russell, right? So we got a... We gotta, we gotta get our marching boots on, put on our hiking pants and our and our journey hat, uh, and set off into the text. So let's begin. Um, so uh, we begin the chapter with a description of a table. George Martin is renowned for his uh, food descriptions, but here we have a uh, a furniture description, bit of a decor description. Well, it's rather a brief one, but we describe. A trestle table. We're told that a trestle table, a kind of a long table, made out of rough-hewn pine. A pine tree has been cut down and made into a table. The table, we are told, has been erected. The table has been erected, made out of a pine tree, uh, and, the tr- and, and the table is set up beneath an elm tree. Which, which right away is... Is 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 a bit complicated, isn't it? Because you'd think that it's the elm tree 
that's erect because it's, you know, still standing. The table is under the tree, the, 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 the elm tree. So is not the elm tree erect, but, but the trestle table, which is a tree that has been cut down and made into a table, surely that is the more flaccid tree in this situation. Surely it's the pine that is flaccid and the elm that is erect, not the other way around. So right away we're getting some really profound symbolism from George R. R. Martin. Which tree is erect? Which is flaccid? And what does it all mean for Tyrion Lannister? Of course, this 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 dick measuring contest uh, is is very central to the to the relationship of Tyrion and Tywin. We're about to get right into some psychoanalytic ass shit between Tyrion and Tywin. We're gonna see some metaphorical dicks swinging around. No literal dicks in this particular. Well, actually, no. Yes, we do have a literal dick in this chapter as well. Um, so, yeah, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna get down and dirty in this chapter, uh, we're gonna get bloody, we're gonna get muddy, it's gonna be a good time. Uh, so, <clears throat> Lord Tywin is having his evening meal with his chief knights and Lord Bannerman, and he has a very pretty banner, it's gold and crimson, and it's hanging overhead from a lofty pike, and Tyrion is going, hmm, uh, Tywin is going, hmm, I'm having my evening meal, I will use my uh, tiny little fork for the tiny little seafood dish, followed by the slightly larger fork for the veal, followed by, Tywin is quite right and proper, but he's also very masculine and proud and strong, and he's hanging out with all of his most important blokes. Uh, and Tyrion rocks up. He rocks up late. He rocks up tardy. Tardy Tyrion, that's what they called him. Uh, he arrives late at the meal. It's evening. Uh, and Tyrion is a bit saddle sore and sour because, of course, he has spent rather a lot of recent time being hauled across one way or another on a horse. And Tyrion's dwarfy body is not well built uh, for this kind of travel. Uh, but he turns up a bit, you know, a bit upset. The march has been long because they've been marching Tywin's army. They're in Tywin's army, what with all the erect pavilions all around, the knights, the bannermans. Um, and so, so Tyrion's a bit annoyed by all of the marching that's been going on. Uh, and, uh, and it's twilight and there are drifting fireflies like that. Uh, uh, that that pestilential owl city song. Uh, and so, we, of course, we then get a food description. Uh, uh, and, and we should, of course, uh, engage the official Alt Drift X food description theme song, which is, which is this. It's probably too quiet for you to hear, but we're going to turn on the theme to describe the food. <clears throat> so we've got five suckling pigs with skin seared and crackling, and there's a different fruit in the mouth of every pig. So in pig number one, you got an apple, right? And in pig number two, you got a banana. In, and in pig number three, you got some grapes. Pig number four, it's a cantaloupe. Pig number five, and this is the exciting one, a watermelon. How does a watermelon fit in the mouth of a pig? Well, well I'm glad you asked. This is a very large pig. This might be the same pig that later kills King Robert. Uh, well, actually, no, we know that's not true. Uh, but, 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 there's pigs. They look delicious. We got some crispy bacon and we got some fruit. It's all the major food groups, really. It's the whole food pyramid. You got the fat pigs for the meat, for the proteins, for the fucking gains, mate, for that alt lift X. Uh, but you've also got the fruits, you know, for those vitamins so your teeth don't fall out. Should have told Captain Cook, you need some vitamin C, you need some vitamin D, you need some color in your diet. So we got all of this lovely food going on in this delicious, meaty, fruity, soiree that Tywin is holding with his bannerman. That was the food description corner. See, we've got segments now. Every show needs segments, and I think that was the first semi-official food description. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, and that takes us to page two. Uh, and so... Tywin uh, greets his son as warmly as ever. Uh, Tywin comes up and says, uh, Tywin, uh, he says Tyrion, he's Tywin, he doesn't say Tywin, he says <clears throat> Tyrion. 
Uh, you're late. Uh, I hope you're not as late to the battle as you are to the table, or all the fighting will be done. Uh, and, and then Tyrion replies, Oh, uh, well, at least you'll save me a peasant or two to kill. Uh, I wouldn't need too many. I wouldn't want to be greedy. Uh, and that, I think, I think represents an interesting sort of attitude that we see a little bit in the books and quite a lot in the show. The idea that killing is something pleasurable that you would want to do. Uh, people have a greed to kill, uh, and they often fight over who gets to do the killing. I think that attitude is hinted at here in the books, and I think it's something that's represented a lot in the show, especially in season six of the show. We have, like, explicit scenes, like arguments, conversations that are about people arguing over who gets to do the act of killing. Uh, and not to go into a tangent or anything, but I think that's quite fucked up. Like, it, it was most obvious in the scene with the Hound and the Brotherhood Without Banners, where the Brotherhood Without Banners was hanging Lem uh, and his two mates uh, who had attacked uh, Brother brother Meribald Happy Man's house. Uh, and and the Hound is like, oh, I, I want to kill these men. And so the Brotherhood Without Banners is like, oh, we'll let you kill one of these men. And they're like bargaining over who gets to do the act of killing these people like, presumably because, like, the act of killing is somehow pleasurable or, or, or just or right or something. And it's the same uh, on that ship when Abara and Nymeria in Season 6 kill Tristane Martell. Uh, so, like, uh, Obara goes and kills Tristane before Nymeria can, and then Nymeria says, Oh, Obara, you're a greedy bitch for killing Tristane. I wanted to kill Tristane. So there's this fucking bizarre morality where people are not only killing, people are not only killing one another for political gain and for all these things, but 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 they're killing because they want to kill. And peop and characters do this like like it like it it's one thing to represent something that's fucked up in fiction, and it's another thing to represent something fucked up and have it done by sympathetic characters and present it in a way that is kind of meant to be sympathetic. I think we as an audience are meant to uh sympathize with this idea of killing being something good and fun that we should all get down with. Which, 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 to cut a long story short, I think, is a bit fucked up. Not to get too real, but I mean, that whole last episode, the previous episode of Old Truth Text, that last chapter, in many ways was about how rape is fucked up. As soon as you use that word, that R word, uh, people get really uncomfortable. Which, of course, I think we should. But it, it's, it's murder, killing, and, and specifically taking pleasure in the act of killing, uh, is probably also something we should be uncomfortable with. You know? Again, not to hold human suffering as some kind of measuring contest, not saying any kind of suffering is necessarily more legitimate than others, but, like, murder... Murder surely is, is right up there with rape in terms of ungood things which we should not celebrate. So, I don't know. Let's... I mean... Just, just, don't, don't, don't murder. Please, please don't murder. Do, do, do us all a favour. Don't hurt people. Uh, but of course there will be a lot of hurting and a lot of violence going on. We won't, we won't try to moralise through all of it, I promise. We are, in fact, going to take a bit of pleasure. We're going to be hypocrites and we're going to enjoy some of the violence that is to follow in this chapter. So let's, without further ado, just get into it, shall we? So Tyrion comes up and he has a conversation with Tywin, and Tywin and Tyrion are as passive-aggressive to one another as ever. These guys really hate each other, Tywin and Tyrion, and, and, and Tywin is constantly criticising his son Tyrion, and Tyrion is constantly making all these sarcastic, defensive, insecure, passive-aggressive responses, and they're really getting up in each other's grill. Um... They did the ding sound then. I'm not sure why that happened. I might have to adjust the settings. Uh, I think there was a donation. Yes, there was a donation. Uh, so thank you very much uh, from Jojoba. Thank you kindly for your donation. We will respond to the any messages and such at the end of the chapter. Uh, but thank you for your donation. So uh, Tyrion and Tywin are talking and they uh, are really pretty unhappy with each other. Uh, but Tyrion at least is happy because he gets to bite into some pig. And indeed, we get some hot juice running down the meat. Um, 
I imagine the pig would have preferred the hot juice to remain inside its body. I know I'd like to keep my hot juice inside of my body. Well, most, most flavors. Well, let's not. Anyway, uh, so the Tywin and <laughs> Tyrion are chatting, uh, and they're pretty unhappy with each other, and Tywin mentions that the Stark host, the Tywin army, uh, Rob's army, the Stark army, uh, is descending south from the twins. Uh, and of course, we know that that's actually Roos Bolton's army, Roos Bolton's smaller force, uh, while Rob's army, the larger part of the northern army, is actually heading towards uh, River Run, where Jamie and Edmure are. Uh, but anyway, so Bolton's host is... Uh, but the Lannisters don't know that. So Bolton's ho- uh, host is uh, going south, uh, and, uh, and we're expecting to have a fight between Tywin's army and the Northern Army, led by Roose Bolton. Uh, and, and Tyrion complains, Father, I don't want to talk about war, or I'm busy, I'm busy trying to eat. Um, and so Tywin just keeps relentlessly criticizing and attacking Tyrion, going, oh, are you unmanned? Are you cowardly in the face of this Stark boy? Your brother Jamie, who's better than you in every respect, he wouldn't be afraid uh, of Rob Stark. He'd be eager to get into the fight. Why are you such a shit son, Tyrion? Why are you so insufficient, Tyrion? Why are you so undeserving of my paternal love, Tyrion? Daddy issues are just being fucking thrown at at Tyrion as though through a verbal catapult. Tywin is merciless in his criticism of Tyrion, and damn, that would really wear a kid down growing up under a father like Tywin. Uh, We we should all count ourselves lucky not to have Tywin as a father, I would say. Uh, But then again, there are perks to having Tywin as a father, such as being very rich and comfortable most of the time, so then there's that. Uh, Anyway, so they're talking about the war to come, uh, and uh, Tyrion mentions, oh, all of my mountain clansmen, my savages who I brought from the Vale, they are going to be handy in this war to come. Uh, so that'll be great, at least. Um, uh, and though, of course, uh, the other Lannisters, Lord Lefford and Tywin and Kevin, sort of question whether the mountain clansmen will be useful. Um, also, we get this, we get a little bit of a line uh, where it's mentioned that we keep talking about rape, and I'm sorry. Uh, but we get this line where it's mentioned, uh, where when Tyrion went up to, like, the guy, the quartermaster who was running all of the equipment, and Tyrion said, yo, I need you to give me a bunch of swords and stuff for my mountain clansmen to use, uh, the, the quartermaster guy looked, quote, as though, like, his response, his reaction was as though uh, Tyrion had asked uh, f- uh, to, for the guy to turn his virgin daughters over to the mountain clansmen's pleasure. Um, which, which... I think, you know, implies rape, uh, again, um, and I, and I think it, it just, it's just one of those examples of, like, the rapiness of Westeros, and, like, George Martin, when he talks about, like, the, the sexual violence and assault in this series, often says that, well, you know, what I'm trying to do is depict a realistic vision of war, and yeah, as we talked about in last episode, undoubtedly war, um, in, 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 in many cases historically has involved rape, and that's something that you've got to identify, that's something you've got to come to terms with, and I think that's really, uh, legitimate. Um, but at the same time, uh, there have been some people, some historians, there are some really great write-ups on Tumblr and elsewhere explaining how, uh, in a lot of ways, Westeros is actually worse than the real medieval Europe in a bunch of ways, uh, but but even specifically in the whole rapiness thing, the whole sort of, the commonality of sexual assault, I don't claim to be an expert, but a lot of people who are say that the world depicted by George R. R. Martin is quite a lot rapier than uh, the real medieval Europe was and 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 again like all right well George Martin is an artist who's free to make whatever kind of world he finds most interesting writing about do what you want to do but there is something uncomfortable about it that it seems that at every opportunity George Martin will insert some kind of reference to to you know some kind of nubile girls young ones getting ravaged by some cruel like soldier it just seems to happen at every opportunity like Taisha um is is one particularly gratuitous example. But anyway, let's not overdwell on this. But I think it's just interesting to note uh, the Westeros is really rapey, um, perhaps more than even makes any kind of sense in terms of historical parallels or anything. Anyway, let's continue on. Um, so they're talking about the war to come. Uh, Tyrion's like, yo, my mountain clansmen are going to be dope. 
Uh, and uh, the Lannisters are questioning that. Uh, and then it's really funny, like Lefford, the, the guy who gave uh, the arms and the armor to the mountain clansmen, was complaining that, you know, the, the big hairy clansman, what was his name? Shagger. Shagger insisted that he needed two battle axes, like the huge two-handed battle axes. Uh, he, he demanded two of them, one for each arm. And he already had an axe. He had a wood axe on his back. So he had a wood axe on his back and a battle axe in each hand. Who needs three axes? And Tyrion's like, well, Tyrion figures that the more axes, the better, you know? Uh, And, you know, he likes to have a big two-handed battle axe in each hand. He likes to kill with both hands at the same time. He's an efficient one, is Shagger. Shagger, at the end of the day, is all about multitasking. Uh, And so perhaps that's why he feels he needs three axes. Side note, sidebar, uh, in one of the Douglas Adams books, I I think it was The Hitchhiker's Guide, maybe a different one, but there's this really nice little sub-story, little tangent, you could say. Douglas Adams' writing is full of tangents, but one of his tangents is about a guy who's just this kind of, like, completely nondescript person who just sort of lives a nondescript life, and there's nothing really remarkable about this person at all, except the narrator tells us that, unbeknownst to this person, uh, he happens to be a direct descendant of Genghis Khan, uh, I think it was, or some sort of ancient warlord. Um, and this, and this doesn't really manifest itself in the life of this person in any particular way, him being a descendant of Genghis Khan, but he does mention uh, that this person finds he has an inexplicable fondness for axes. Uh, And so in his little nondescript cottage, in his little nondescript world, uh, he has some some axes decorating his home uh, because he happens to be related to Genghis Khan. Axes. A a fondness to axes can be a charismatic, funny thing to a character, I think. I mean, everyone loves Gimli, right? I mean, some people complain that Gimli in The Lord of the Rings was reduced to a bit of a comic relief character, you know, on the battlements of Helm's Deep, complaining that he's too short to see over the walls and whatever, and, you know, you can can complain about that. In the books, Gimli's more of a proud warrior, you know? Ah, but he's short, and you've always got to make fun of the short people uh, in fantasy, don't you? Otherwise, who else are you going to laugh at, you know? You know? Uh, But hey, axes. Uh, moving on. So, uh, they're talking about the Mountain Clansmen, uh, and they seem pretty cool, and Tyrion assures the Lannisters that the Mountain Clansmen will be useful. Uh, and then it's broken to Tyrion the news, hey, by the way, uh, plan is to put you guys on the vanguard. Uh, and what vanguard means, uh, is for, uh, Tyrion and his Mountain Clansmen to be at the front lines, at the front of the battle. Uh, which is, which is kind of dangerous, kind of dangerous being at the front of a big old battle, especially when you're a stubby little dwarf man, uh, who's not all that well suited to battle physically. Uh, and so T- uh, Tyrion immediately suspects, uh, that, uh, Tywin is trying to get him killed to, quote, get rid of his embarrassing get for good. Tywin has always felt ashamed by the existence of his son Tyrion, uh, for his grotesque dwarfism, uh, for his drinking, for his whoring, uh, and therefore Tywin has long hoped to get rid of Tyrion one way or another, and so Tyrion suspects that Tywin is trying to achieve this by putting him in the vanguard in this battle. Uh, so, uh, so that's rough. Not only is Tyr- uh, Tywin relentlessly criticizing Tyrion, uh, but he now seems to be literally trying to get him killed. Uh, And no sad girl, this is season one. I mean, we don't actually get to see the battle in season one. We'll get to this. Uh, Due to budgetary constraints, uh, they instead had Tyrion just hit and knocked out right before the battle started in the show, so they didn't have to uh, stage any elaborate battle scenes in the show. But in the book, we actually do uh, witness the battle from Tyrion's point of view. Uh, So we will get into that shortly. Um... And so, uh, yeah, and so Tyrion looks at Tywin and sees Tywin watching, judging him. Uh, Tyrion and Cersei and Jaime all note this multiple times, the, the judgment of their father, watching them, glaring at them, seeing into their soul, drilling into their insecurities uh, and, their, and their vulnerabilities. Uh, so, so all of the Lannister children are made, made to feel very insecure and vulnerable due to Tywin's terrible influence. 
Uh, and so, uh, and so Tyrion describes some of the shit that's been going down among the mountain clansmen who have been hanging out in the Lannister camp. Um, and so apparently, uh, they haven't been getting along all that peacefully because, because of course, Tyrion has tried to unite a whole bunch of different feuding clans who are normally on opposite sides, uh, or at least, you know, not all that friendly into one cohesive army, which is no mean feat. So he's describing some of the conflicts between all the different clans. So one time a moon brother stabbed a stone crow over a sausage, uh, and then a bunch of stone crows killed the, the, the stabber, uh, to avenge the stab E. Um, perhaps Tyrion notes they were trying to get the sausage back. Uh, and so there's a whole bunch, there's a whole bunch of, uh, shit going on among that rabble. Uh, and then Tywin declares, uh, that, well, if your soldiers lack discipline, it's because their commander, you, uh, just, just lacks, lacks the right skills. It's your fault that your rabble is not neat and orderly, uh, which again is one of Tywin's classic, uh, completely unreasonable criticisms, TM. Like, come on, like, Tywin, can you really, can you really expect anyone, let alone Tyrion, to be able to hammer the mountain clansmen from a bunch of random bandits into the hills into some kind of organized, respectable, uh, regimented fighting force. No one, no one should be expected to turn the clansmen into some kind of a trained, proper army in a matter of days. And yet here Tywin is blaming Tyrion for the clansmen being who they are. So Tywin is not only, you know, mean, he's, he's, he's completely absurd in some of the ways he criticizes Tyrion. He really clearly just seeks to undermine Tyrion and make him feel like shit at every possible opportunity. I think it's true even more so in the books than in the show. Tywin's a a cunt in the show too, but I think even more so in the books. Um, Alrighty. Uh, So uh, Tyrion's describing what's going on uh, with the uh, clansmen. Tywin is criticizing Tyrion and being a cunt. Uh, and yeah, we get this whole exchange where Tyrion, where Tywin's like, oh, well, if you aren't good enough to be on the vanguard, maybe you should just guard our baggage train and just be shit there. Uh, and Tyrion's like, fine, all right, if you think I'm such a piece of shit, no, I'll prove you wrong. I'll lead the vanguard. Uh, and then Tywin's like, well, I was never going to let you lead the vanguard. I was going to put you in the most dangerous place, but I wasn't going to trust you to lead the vanguard. I'm going to have Gregor Clegane the Mountain do that. And so Tyrion's like fuck, you know what, like, I've had enough of this bullshit, I've had enough of this unreasonableness, I'm, I'm just gonna leave, I've had enough of your unreasonable criticism, I'm going. He spits out his pork and says, I'm not hungry anymore, and marches off. Uh, so Tywin is undoubtedly a cunt, although Tyrion is not really very good at handling Tywin. I mean, you know, it's never going to be easy, de- easy dealing with a dad who's such a dick. Uh, but but Tyrion really uh, lets Tywin get under his skin. You'd think after all the years he might have developed strategies for, for dealing with such an unreasonable father, but apparently he doesn't. He storms out, um, and, 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 and the plan remains for Tyrion to go into the vanguard. If Tyrion was smarter, you'd think he would have, uh, played that situation more cleverly so that he didn't have to go in the vanguard, which again is a very dangerous thing for a dwarf to do, uh, or for anyone to do. Uh, but, uh, Tyrion's, uh, skillful means of, 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 of controlling situations and, and adjusting his position socially and politically and, and in terms of power... Uh, doesn't seem to extend all the way to his relationship with Tywin. Uh, and so Tywin, uh, Tywin, Tywin overrules Tyrion here in this situation, and Tyrion is going to be in the van. And then as Tyrion leaves the table with all of the bannermen, all the Lannister important war leaders around, uh, they laugh at Tyrion, or, or they laugh as Tyrion stomps off back down the hill. Um... And Tyrion is conscious of their eyes on his back, and he hopes they all choke on their suckling pigs. So Tyrion certainly has a lot of resentment towards people and towards the world for his mistreatment at their hands. Which, you know, not entirely unreasonable, uh, because people do treat him unreasonably sometimes. But on the other hand, you know, Tyrion probably could man up a bit, to be honest. Tyrion probably could step up to the plate. Tyrion probably could prevent himself from being triggered quite so hard by his father, but... You know, it it would be hard. So let's 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 pass what pass what judgment you may. Uh, so he leaves, and he walks among the Lannister camp, and there's a lot of different Lannisters uh, hanging out uh, in this big camp. Lots of all the all the different people from the Westerlands who serve the Lannisters, uh, and we also have uh, the Mountain clansmen 
uh, and all these different blokes hanging out, uh, and Tyrion smells uh, the scents of all the food, garlic, sausages, food description, blah, 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 um, and, uh, and he feels alone. Uh, so this parag- the, po- the point of this paragraph is that Tyrion feels isolated and alone. And that's one of the themes of Tyrion's story. Tyrion has all this wealth, Tyrion has all this power, Tyrion has all this intelligence, Tyrion has a lot going for him, but he feels very isolated. And some of the only people who hang out with him are people who he literally pays uh, for the pleasure of their company. People like Bronn and, soon, we'll see, Shay. Uh, and yeah, as Stephanie Morris points out, yeah, Tyrion literally, a few chapters ago, just smashed a, ty- a, a singer's hand, broke the hand uh, of the singer Marillion just because he just was annoyed by his presence and his singing and stuff. Like, Marillion was a bit of a dick, but Tyrion fucking broke his hand for, for very little reason. Um, so I think a lot of the characters' personalities are more extreme in the books, I think, and that includes Tyrion. Tyrion is kind of a prick. Like, he's really easy to like. Tyrion's very easy to like because he's so funny and he's so witty and he's so smart and, you know, unreasonable things do happen to him so we sympathise with him for that and we see things from his point of view. But honestly, Tyrion is kind of a massive dick sometimes. Uh, he does some. He does a lot of things that are that are mean to people. He 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 speaks in a mean way to people, um, and I think a lot of that comes from you know his resentments and and all his emotional issues and his daddy issues and his dwarfism issues and all of that stuff. But yeah, let's remember that while Tyrion is a lot of fun and a really likable character, he also is fairly regularly kind of a prick. Runs in the family. Uh, anyway, so uh, so Tyrion's walking around the camps, and the, some of the Stone Crows, one of the Mountain Clansmen, try to welcome uh, try to welcome Tyrion to his camp. So you know, in this moment of Tyrion feeling alone, uh, we we get an offer from the Stone Crows of going like, "Yo, come out, come hang out with us." Uh, and the Stone Crows seem to be having a pretty great time. The Mountain Clansmen know how to party. They've got, like, this camp, and they've got this this entire ox, like an entire fucking cow, a whole big chunk of meat. Uh, with It's like on a spit, like on a spit roast, but, but, but it's an entire cow, and so they've got, like, a whole tree. Um, they've got, like, a whole tree that the cow is hanging off because that's how enormous it is, and they're roasting it over this massive bonfire. Like, these guys don't fuck around. This is, like, some fucking, uh, Flintstones-style cookery or something. Um, they're having a good time, and they welcome Tyrion to the fire, but Tyrion's like, eh, eh, call you back. So at this time that he's feeling lonely... Uh, he does reject uh, other people who are welcoming, who are trying to connect with him and engage with him. So I don't know. Maybe Tyrion, uh, Tyrion is failing to engage with people, even who are offering to take him out of his alienation and his isolation. Uh, so that in itself is a little bit sad. Um, and so, and again, we have more mentions of grease stripping down chins and flames and stuff. Uh, so George Martin is working in some more food descriptions here. But Tyrion comes to his own tent, uh, down in the middle amongst all of the mountain clansmen. And inside Tyrion's tent, uh, he finds Bronn having a drink with some of Tyrion's servants. Uh, one of whom, uh, is a young boy, uh, who we later find is Podrick Payne. Uh, but also with Bronn and Pod is a woman, a girl. Uh, an 18-year-old girl, approximately 18-year-old girl, called Shay. Uh, And uh, we get a description of Podrick first, though. Uh, And so... And so Podrick uh, has been assigned to Tyrion's service to be Tyrion's squire uh, after he turned up... uh, after he turned up at the army. Uh, And it's described that uh, Podrick Payne is a distant cousin uh, of Ilan Payne. Uh, who is the king's headsman, the executioner, uh, though Podrick does not seem to share much uh, in terms of personality uh, with his cousin, Ilan. Uh, do, 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 uh, uh. Um, and, 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 and Podrick, Tyrion notes, is almost as quiet as Ilan Payne is, uh, although it's not for lack of a tongue, because Ilan Payne, of course, uh, had his tongue ripped out by King Aerys uh, for some bullshit reason, uh, and so Ilan therefore has not been very chatty uh, over these last 20 years or so. Podrick is almost as quiet, but for him, in, in his case, it's almost, uh, it, it, it's due mostly to shyness. Uh, and uh, and one time Tyrion made Podrick stick out his tongue just to check, just to make sure that Podrick does indeed have a tongue, uh, but he doesn't seem to use it much because Tyrion is quite shy. But anyway, Tyrion turns his attention to the girl, Shay. 
Uh, and so it emerges that uh, Tyrion got Bronn to go and fetch a woman for him. Apparently, armies attract camp followers. Uh, because armies in the medieval uh, context are full of all sorts of people. In order to keep an army alive, you need cooks, you need people doing washing, you need people building stuff, bu- building trestle tables, erecting pine trees, you need people uh, making the tents. You, you, there's a whole lot of, it's a whole big operation to keep an army running in medieval Europe. Uh, and some of the people who are involved in this big operation are camp followers, women who are prostitutes or something of the like. Uh, and so Tyrion asked Bronn to go and fetch one of these women, and so Bronn fetched this woman called Shay. Uh, and so Shay and Tyrion uh, are introduced to one another, um, and Shay immediately comes across as relatively assertive. Uh, she's not meek and shy. Uh, when when Tyrion asks Bronn, is this her, is this the girl that you've brought to me, Shay says, it is, my lord, and I can speak for myself, if it please you. Uh, so Shay is rather bold. She's not. She's not desperately trying to please this lordling. She's got a certain confidence to her. Uh, so she's unlike some of the other uh, low status women who have seen in this story so far. Uh, and Tyrion says, "Well, oh, well, my name's Tyrion. They call me the Imp. Who are you?" And Shay says, "Well, my name is Shay, and men call me often." So Shay is not without a certain wit. Uh, and so. Um, and so, yeah, Tyrion describes how Bronn, he got Bronn to go and find a woman for him, uh, and uh, and then Shay and Tyrion have a chat. Bronn leaves, he doesn't want to be the third wheel, uh, and Shay and Tyrion have a chat. Uh, and um, and Shay again ex- expresses a certain amount of wit and confidence uh, when, uh, when Tyrion asks, are you a maiden, girl? Are you a virgin? Because, of course, uh, a woman's value is... Uh, greater in the society if she is a virgin. The hymen is the seat of value in a human being uh, for half the population. Uh, and Tyrion is like, are you a virgin? And Shay says, I am if it pleases you, my lord. And Tyrion says, uh, well, I, what I would like from you is the truth. And Shay's like, well, that'll cost you double. Uh, so Shay's being quite, uh, quite, uh, quite, 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 uh, well, confident, shall we say. Uh, and Tyrion decides that they'll get along splendidly. He enjoys the banter, uh, does our Tyrion, and so he takes an immediate liking to this Shay. And then Tyrion describes the job description. Tyrion describes what he's demanding from this Shay girl, what the transaction is, what the arrangement is uh, between Tyrion and Shay. So he basically says, all right, yo, here's the deal. Uh, I want to have sex with you. He doesn't use those exact words, but he's going to have sex with Shay. And he also says, but that along with that, I want you to hang out with me in my tent. I want you to give me wine. I want you to laugh at my jokes. I want you to rub the ache out of my legs after a day's ride. And I want you to sleep with no one else. So Tyrion has very specific ideas about what he wants this woman, this prostitute, um, to do with him. And it's not just prostitution, is it? It's, 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 a, it's a relationship that he's buying. He doesn't just want sex. He wants conversation and he wants company. Uh, and this perhaps highlights, again, Tyrion's loneliness and alienation. He, he's literally paying someone not only to have sex with him, but to pretend that they like him. Which is really tragic and sad, especially given how much of a likable person Tyrion is. We as an audience like Tyrion, I think most of us do, uh, and yet here he is paying people in his desperation to find human connection with people. That is desperately sad and highlights his alienation by a society that reviles him for his appearance and his dwarfism. Uh, and so that's a bit sad. But then Shay and Tyrion have sex. Uh, so again, you know, you got to sort of wonder what this sort of means to Shay. Because, um, you, you know, Shay doesn't have a lot of choice in this situation, of course. We learn that Bronn took Shay from some other man, from some knight. Um, and Shay was taken from this knight by force. Uh, so, you know, do, does Shay have the option of turning down this transaction with Tyrion, this agreement to be, his, to be his hired, his hired partner, sexual and emotional? Does she have a choice in this situation? Hardly. Uh, Tyrion has the power to do whatever he wants with her, really. Is this a commercial transaction? Is this slavery? It's, or some blurry thing in between. Obviously, Shay uh, is, 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 is not in a powerful position in this situation. And, of course, she's very young. Tyrion reckons she looks about 18. She's a teenager. Uh, and for all her confidence and her wit, she does seem 
uh, relatively strong as a character, but she's still, in terms of status and power, uh, not far ahead in this particular game. Uh, but yes, it's 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 been said. Next page. Uh, they they have sex. We have we have a literal penis uh, to go along with all of the metaphorical ones. Uh, and and when Tyrion enters her, uh, Shay whispers endearments, uh, and and she makes all these gasps of pleasure. And Tyrion suspects that her delight is feigned. Uh, but but she does it so well that it doesn't matter. He doesn't want to really know the truth. Of whether of whether of whether she's really enjoying this as much as she's acting. Um, damn, prostitution's weird, isn't it? Because 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 Tyrion wants to believe that Shay is really enjoying the experience, the experience that he is paying her to participate in, uh, and part of him knows that she's acting to a certain extent, but he doesn't want to know it. It's an act of self-deception. Uh, which is a deeply strange thing, perhaps. Uh, and then Tyrion and Shay lie together after having sex, and Tyrion uh, decides that he really enjoyed it, uh, and he really he really enjoys being this woman, and he hasn't been with a woman uh, since almost a year, since before he left for Winterfell in King's Landing. Um, which is interesting, because Tyrion sort of got this reputation, perhaps it's more in the show, but Tyrion seems to have this reputation of being, like, constantly having sex with prostitutes and whores, and that's just one of the things that he loves to do. Um, but, but, here he's saying that he hasn't done it in, like, a year. Um, so maybe that reputation is false, at least in the books. Maybe Tyrion isn't such a whoremonger, despite what Tywin claims. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of, sort of, sadness about Tyrion in this chapter, I think. Uh, but this relationship with Shay certainly adds an interesting new element to what's going on. Anyway, um, so uh, they stay together and they have a bit of a sort of intimate moment. Uh, Tyrion sort of whistles a song and Shay asks him what the tune is and they have a nice little sort of moment of human connection. A moment of human connection that's paid for, uh, but that's an asterisk that Tyrion doesn't want to remember right now. Uh, And then Tyrion leaves. Shay seems to nod off to sleep and then Tyrion leaves... Uh, leaves the tent, he leaves naked, um, and, and Bronn is outside, Bronn is sharpening his sword, um, that's, that's a metaphorical penis, not a literal one for those who are keeping score, uh, and Bronn is wide awake, he does not seem to sleep like other men, so Bronn is very, very competent, it should be noted in the books, he's very switched on, he's a very good fighter, he knows how to stay alive, Bronn is, Bronn's not wasting his time, uh, paying teenagers to pretend that they like him. He's focusing on the job at hand, which is not being killed. Bronn is a pragmatist. Um, and so, uh, he has a chat, uh, between Bronn and Tyrion, and yeah, Bronn reveals that he took Shay from another night by force, um, uh, and they just have a bit of sort of banter, it's not terribly important, and then they talk about the battle to come, uh, and Tyrion basically says to Bronn, look, Bronn, you got a new job, uh, Shay's job is to pretend that she likes me, your job, Bronn, uh, is to make sure I survive this battle. I would like to not die, and I will pay you a whole bunch of money if I survive this battle, and Bronn says, done deal, I'll do what I can. Uh, so they try to do their best. Uh, and, um, uh, and yeah, they talk about how, well, you know, it's kind of a good thing that the mountain, uh, is part of our vanguard, because the mountain is a very large target for all of the archers to hit, so he'll draw fire from us, uh, and that'll be grand. Um, and, oh god, we're already 43 minutes in, and we're barely into this bloody chapter. Alright, we'll have to pick up the pace a little bit. We're gonna roll on like a fucking steam train, mateos. Cling on, because we're gonna fucking row harder. Uh, do you row a train? I don't think you row a train. I don't think trains have oars, but row harder anyway, we're going to get onwards. Um, and so, uh, he goes back into the tent, and Shay is awake again, uh, and they sort of chat some more, uh, and we have another moment of intimacy, paid for intimacy, uh, when, um, when Shay describes some man as a small man, and Tyrion says, oh, well, he's a small man, what am I, a giant? And then Shay says, Shay purrs, oh, yes, my giant of Lannister. Uh, and then they have sex again. Uh, so Tyrion, Tyrion sort of led Shay into saying what he wanted her to think. Tyrion has just been humiliated 
by his father and by his bannerman. He was made to feel small as a dwarf, and now he's he's paying Shay in this moment of intimacy to give him the feeling of being a big man. So Tyrion really is uh, agonized by the feeling of being made to be small uh, and belittled. Uh, and so he's trying to find the feeling of being a big, important man. Because uh, apparently you need to be... Uh, yes, indeed, Stephanie Morris, because bloody Freud wrote this chapter, and that explains everything going on in this chapter. S- Stephanie Morris is often, often, often pretty on point with the, uh, with the, with the comments, I've got to say. Well done, Stephanie. Um, I, I only, I only catch, like, some of the comments, like, I only see some of them after half of my eye, so I'm sure some of you are saying interesting things that I'm not catching, I apologize, but we gotta keep this train rolling, mate. Anyway, um, so, so, Shay says, my giant of Lannister, and then they go to sleep, and then, cold opening, <laughs> alarm clock's going, Neo, wake up, Neo, wake up, <laughs> Wide open. It's the next morning. You know those sleeps where sometimes where you where you go to sleep and and then you 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 just like blink. You don't even go to sleep. It's just the night time. You're in bed. You blink and then your eyes are open and it's the morning time and your alarm's going and you got to get to work. And it's like what the fuck? I didn't even sleep. I just did the time warp. L- let's do the time warp again. I'm just whoa. You know when the morning just hits you like that. It happens sometimes. The morning hits Tyrion, and it's a pretty, uh, it's a, it's, it's, it's a big one, because, uh, spoiler, the battle is beginning. There are trumpets, there's people running around, wagons are being loaded, fires are being extinguished, everyone's running around, and Shay, by the way, uh, her eyes are wide and white, and she says that she's scared, I'm frightened. So we see vulnerability from Shay. We're reminded that for all of her confidence and all of her charm and all of her wit and all of her seduction, Shay uh, is, at the end of the day, an 18-year-old girl who's, sh- who's scared about this battle and she doesn't want to be killed. Uh, so we see a bit of sort of human vulnerability from Shay alongside all of Tyrion's vulnerability that we witness firsthand throughout this chapter. So anyway, uh, oh, uh, it's it's the birthday tomorrow for... Uh, is that Carrick? Carpo. Happy birthday for tomorrow, Carpo. Uh, but the battle is beginning, uh, and so and so everyone needs to get ready for the battle, and so Bronn comes trotting out. Bronn is, of course, already prepared, already ready. He's got, he's on his horse, he's got his armor, he's got his sword, he is ready to fight. And then Tyrion's like, what the fuck's going on? We weren't expecting, we weren't expecting the battle to begin right away, uh, but Bronn's like, well, the Stark snuck up on us, man. Uh, Rob Stark came in the night, his host was marching down during the night, not slowing down, and he's almost upon us, so we've got to get ready for the battle. Uh, although, of course, we know that Rob Stark isn't actually there. Uh, and so, uh, the clansmen are ready to ride, or the clansmen are getting ready to ride, they need to get the army together, um, and, uh, and... <laughs> And Tyrion, for all of all of the intimacy that Tyrion just shared with Shay, uh, he barks at Shay, woman. He doesn't say woman, but he's but he's like, ah, get, bring me my clothes, the leather. Yes, bring me my boots, woman. Do do the thing, fetch the stuff that I need. Uh, so at the same time that Tyrion is treating Shay as like an intimate partner who he's you know sharing some real human connection with or trying to to some extent, uh, he also uh, is treating her like a servant who needs to fetch his shit when he can't be bothered to. Uh, so it's it's an interesting, complicated dynamic, isn't it? Where this weird power dynamic with, with, with this teenager and this man, this man who's paying this teenager for sex and service, intimacy, and uh, for, for just errands, it's, it's a weird, gross relationship, but anyway, so the battle, they're getting ready for the battle, um, and, um, and at home, back at Castle Rock, Tyrion has a really great set of armor that's expertly crafted to fit his dwarf body, but the problem is that the armor's over in, over in Castle Rock, and he hasn't got it with him, of course, he's just come straight from, like, the veil and all that shit, so he hasn't got the right stuff with him, uh, so Tyrion... The armor that he's wearing for this battle uh, is just randomly, like, scavenged together. It's not his proper custom armor. Uh, it's it's just scavved together as random bits and pieces thrown together. So he's looking like some kind of post-apocalypse. It's, he's looking like a character in an RPG when you just sort of haphazardly grab whichever armor pieces have the highest stats and chuck them on and you look so, like some ridiculous, like, hockey player with, like, 
gardening outfits and like 90s denim and just this ridiculous fashion mix up um like some kind of zoolander meets yeezy season three meets fallout 4 sort of a situation uh that's what Tyrion looks like in his armor his ill-fitting armor one of the things that um Tyrion is wearing in this in this in this outfit is a is a helmet that has a one foot spike on the top it's all it's a little bit like flemond brax uh, it's not quite as as impressive or phallic as Flement Brax's helmet. Flement Brax is, of course, the unicorn knight, uh, but Tyrion does have a spike, a horn, on the top of his head, and in fact we'll see him use that spike to great effect later in the chapter, so get excited for that. Um... And yes, yeah, so we get a description of armor. George Martin loves his food descriptions. He also likes his armor descriptions sometimes. He talks about all of the lobstered greaves and the dead knight's gorget and all of blah, blah, blah. But we're not so interested in armor descriptions here. Uh, uh, he's, he's clad in steel and he's going into battle. Uh, and, then, and then Tyrion says to Shay, if I die, weep for me. And then Shay says, well, you'll be dead. How will you know? And then Tyrion says, I'll know. And then Shay says, hmm. I believe you. And I did that in the show as well, which is nice. Um, is it Cardinal Doomsday's birthday? Apparently it's Cardinal Doomday, Doomsday's birthday. Happy birthday, if it is your birthday, Cardinal Doomsday. Uh, and, um, oh, and Ernest. I, I should also say hello to Ernest, because I think Ernest has been gunning for a shout-out, so I hope you're having a lovely weekend, Ernest. But anyway, we're not going to get derailed. We're on the tracks. Uh, and so they're going off to the battle, um, and, and Shay tells Tyrion, Oh, you look fearsome, Tyrion. And Tyrion says, I don't look fearsome. I look like a dwarf in mismatched armor. But I thank you for your kindness. So again, that cognitive dissonance. Tyrion wants Shay to tell him that he looks fearsome. Tyrion wants Shay to tell him that he's the giant of Lannister. But at the same time, he's painfully aware of the reality that he's a dwarf, and he's not a warrior, and he's not a giant. So Tyrion is 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 hurt by the tension between reality and ideal, as we all are. You know how in like motors, you know how like the function of a motor uh, is that there's like no better analogy. You know how like the membranes of cells in biology, like the whole fucking way uh, that that just biology works on like a cellular level. It, it, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that there's like this. There's like these salts and shit, like the like 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 K or whatever. There's like these these chemicals inside every cell, uh, and there's like this differential, this difference in chemistry between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. And it's just like this difference in like charge, like like ionization or like negative charge or positive charge or like there's 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 like an energy, there's a tension, there's a cognitive dissonance, there's a flavor, there's a contrast, there's some shit between what's inside the cell and what's the outside of the cell. And that and that tension, that little that little fucking that 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 little spark, that difference, that 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 dichotomy uh is 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 what sort of uh drives engineers the the cell membrane that determines what's inside of the cell and what's outside of the cell. It's like this chemistry. And there are certain times uh that like that like the chemistry flicks off. Well, no, maybe the maybe the previous metaphor was a better one with the engine. Look, the point is that 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 you can drive something, you can power something with a differential, with a difference that can like bam, like snap. Sometimes it's like a neuron, like um, neurotransmitters that just like pop when you give them the right. It's about difference, right? It's about differential that can that can drive and power, right? And that is how people work. Maybe people are driven by difference, like a chemical, neuronal. It's 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 a difference. It's 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 a duality between our ideal selves and our real selves. That is the difference that propels us forward, right? Like the only reason why anyone bothers to do anything is because they recognize, okay, this is the reality of my present self, and here's the future ideal self that I want to become. It, the only reason why we get up and have breakfast is in service of becoming that better self. Surely, you've, like all behavior worth anything is goal-directed behavior. You're trying to be something, and so, and so, and so, you've got to have an image of what you want to be compared to an image of what you what you are now. And there's got to be a difference there in order to have something to strive for and something to do, right? 
Is that all wrong or is that true? I'm not sure. But I think I think I think it's that dichotomy, that difference, that cognitive dissonance that drives everything. In the same way that there's like that weird neuronal shit, that cellular shit. Maybe someone can clarify in the comments. Uh or or perhaps, as Stephanie suggests, Swift is just tired. It could be both. Uh, anyway, so um, Tyrion is is experiencing a bit of cognitive dissonance, uh, and uh, he marches out to battle. And we get all these descriptions of how Tyrion feels. His stomach is a hard knot, uh, and he's sweating, and his heart is pounding. And we get a bunch of similar descriptions throughout this chapter. And so it's interesting that uh, it's interesting that Tyrion doesn't. We, we don't have any lines here that say Tyrion was really nervous about the prospect of possibly being killed soon. Tyrion was quite anxious uh, about the whole, you know, probably dying in battle situation. It never says that. Instead, we get all these descriptions uh, of Tyrion's Tyrion's physical symptoms of anxiety. In psychology, there's this idea about this this sort of trichotomy between behavior uh, and and your thoughts. Uh, and and your physical your physical symptoms your physical body reality which are three totally different things you can think one thing and do one thing and 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 feel physically another you could be sweating and shaking and looking like you're really nervous but then you can say I'm not nervous at all and then you can behave in a way that that might be like acting confident and not running away from a situation that might suggest that you are confident behavior. Uh, uh, b- behavior, action, all, physical symptoms, all different things, right? Uh, and so it's interesting that in this chapter, uh, what George Martin uses um, in order to communicate Tyrion's state of mind is the physical symptoms, which is interesting. Maybe that's more of that sort of dissonance because Tyrion doesn't want to acknowledge to himself his anxiety or perhaps, I don't know, there's, there's a lot of different reasons, rationales you could say, but it's interesting. And yeah, t- Tabby B99, I also would like to see Baby Driver. We should all go see Baby Driver. Uh, anyway, uh, and so Tyrion is feeling a bit nervous. He's going out to battle. Uh, I think we all would feel nervous too. Uh, the clansmen, meanwhile, <laughs> don't seem nervous at all. Half of them are still drunk from last night. They're making jokes and they're cursing uh, and they're getting on their horses and riding off to battle. And we have a description of the Jew on the grass. The Jew looks like as if some passing god had scattered a bag of diamonds over the earth. Uh, which is uh, which is kind of a pretty metaphor, uh, kind of a bit on the nose. I've been a bit critical of George Martin's metaphors lately. I don't, I, maybe I've got a bit of a bone to pick. Uh, I don't know. Maybe there's a lack of subtlety. Hashtag nuance. Hashtag nuance. I'm not sure. Um, but um, but yeah. Anyway, so so they're marching off to battle, and the army of Tywin Lannister assembles. Uh, so we get a description of the army. It's like a food description, but even longer. There's there's spears, there's pikes, there's lots of men. There's a big old medieval army. Men-at-arms, sword and axe, and all of these things. There's a bunch of the Lannister Westerman bannermen around. Uh, the Lords Lefford, Lydon, and Serret. Uh, the Triangle, uh, uh, Badger, and uh, and uh, what what's the pretty bird with all the feathers? You know, the green peacock. Those those are the heraldry of those three houses. Uh, hashtag trivia. Adam Marbrand is around. Oh, and uh, guys, get fucking hyped because our main man, the most important character, the 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 the, the, the flax that was the flax that was promised himself, Sir Flemond Brax, has taken the field. Our very own unicorn knight uh, is a part of this battle with his curly unicorn horn with his purple unicorn uh flemont brax has taken the field so you know that it's going to be okay because sir flemont is with us exciting the narwhal that rides love it uh and yeah there's a bunch of other blokes the cray calls the swifts all sorts of blokes uh it's a huge army tywin has forded uh, has put together a big army, and Tywin himself, meanwhile, is staying up back with the reserve. While he puts his son out the front of the army to die, Tywin likes to keep himself safe at the back. Uh, and uh, and Tywin, Tywin's uh, appearance is described, and Tywin is resplendent. This is something that they did they don't do at all in the show either, because I suppose of budgetary re- concerns, and also not wanting to seem ridiculous and cartoonish, because Tywin is fucking blinged the fuck out. 
in this chapter. It's ridiculous. Like if if Tywin if Tywin was a '90s rapper, he would have the gold grill. He would have like dozens of heavy gold chains around the neck. He would have every possible bit of fucking heavy gaudy jewelry to illustrate his power and his wealth to the world. All right, uh, Ty- Tywin Lannister is resplendent. He's covered in gold. He's got a this great cloak, a great cloak of countless layers of cloth of gold. Uh, and he's got miniature lionesses crouching on his shoulders. So like golden little statuettes of lions on each shoulder. And then a, and then a male lion with a magnificent mane sitting on top of, li- uh, of Tywin's helmet. And, and they're all made of gold and they've got ruby eyes. So it's about wealth and power. Uh, and yeah, Space Potato... Good, good name, Space Potato, points out that uh, gold would not be strong enough to be effective armor. I, I expect you're right. I think it's proper steel or whatever underneath, but it's gilded with gold, uh, which, which you know, of course, gilding always has that sort of symbolism of being somehow false. Like, but, like gilding looks pretty, but underneath it's actually something else. There's something false and fake about gilding, isn't there? And perhaps that says something about Tywin. But anyway, yeah, so Tywin is got every possible fucking accessory to show off his wealth uh, to the people around him. Um, really ridiculous blingage. Uh, the crimson, he's got ornate gold scroll work over his armor. Even, like, the fastenings and clippings on his armor is gilded. The steel is burnished to a high sheen that it shines like fire in the light of the rising sun. So, like, Damn, like how fucking insecure have you got to be to wear something like that, right? Like, you know those fuckers who ride around in stretch hummers? Like, as though a limousine was not obnoxious enough, some people have, like, stretch hummers, which are, like, limousines, but, like, with the giant tires and the whole sort of big, tough, masculine, boxy look of the hummer. Like, 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 Tywin is wearing the medieval equivalent of a stretch hummer, which just screams... I really want people to look at me. I've got a really tiny pee-pee, and I want everyone to look at me and think that I'm really important and really rich and really strong, because deep down, I feel like maybe I'm not very important and not very powerful, so please look at me. That's, that's, that's what I think this communicates about Tywin Lannister. Uh, but hey, maybe he just likes the bling. Uh, anyway, so, um, that's what Tywin looks like. He doesn't look anything like that in the show, whatever. Uh, but, but he's really into the gold. He's really into the displays of power. Which, by the way, uh, it was a pretty big influence on Cersei. Um, uh, uh, there, there was a video, there's this obscure YouTuber called Alt Shift X who put out, uh, a video about Cersei Lannister recently, I understand. Uh, a far inferior video to this, this video, this Alt Shift X video, uh, <coughs> it should be said. Uh, no burps in that video, so it ain't shit. Uh, but Cersei Lannister really internalizes a lot of these ideas about physical displays of power. Pride, power that you can see. And she's very frustrated that she doesn't get to do much of that kind of power. Um, but yeah, I should stop, I should stop plugging alt Gif X. I mean, it's, you know, those videos are so short. Why would you want, I mean, come on, we need, alt Swift is where it's at. Um, and so anyway, uh, so Tywin is being like, oh, look at me, I've got a gold-plated stretch hammer, just, I'm really important. Ah, but the foemen are arriving. Um, <laughs> burps, burps aren't sexy. Let's be real, Amy Bennett. Let's, 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 anyway, so the foemen are coming. Rob Stark's army is coming. Though again, Rob Stark isn't in it. It's led by Rhys Bolton. The Northmen are coming. Uh, and then, and, and Tyrion recalls the time that he went to Winterfell and he met Rob Stark. Um, uh, and he, and he remembers Rob Stark's direwolves and how the direwolves kind of attacked Tyrion and snapped at him. And he wondered if Rob would bring his direwolves to war with him. And of course he does. Rob brings Grey Wind to the fight. But Rob and his, and Grey Wind are not at this particular fight. Uh, and Tywin, uh, Tyrion figures that the Northmen must be bloody exhausted right now. Uh, because, because the way that they crept up on the Lannister army was by marching all night instead of sleeping. 
Uh, so, so he figures like, shit, I mean, the Northmen must be exhausted. What was Rob Stark thinking? Um, did they think they were going to be able to sneak up on us before we were ready? Like, that's not going to happen. Tywin Lannister is no fool. Tywin Lannister doesn't get tricked by anyone. I think a lot of, a lot of people who are sort of cowed by their domineering father tend to think of their father as infallible you know, godlike almost in their authority and their power. And I think Tyrion is thinking about Tywin in this way. Uh, Tywin, Tyrion thinks that Tywin is as invincible as he is, 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 is a dick. Um, and, and because of course he thinks, oh, you know, there's no way Tywin could possibly be tricked. There's no way you could fool Tywin. Well, of course, yeah, he fucks up just like anyone else. He shits. He doesn't shit gold. He shits shit like anybody else. We learn that on the privy. Tywin is only a man, and Tywin is sometimes tricked. Uh, and in this case, Tywin is being tricked. Tywin thinks that he's fighting Rob Stark's army. He's actually fighting a small offshoot of Rob Stark's army, and Rob is meanwhile riding off to River Run to beat up Tywin's dear son, Jamie. Uh, so Tywin is rather more mortal than Tyrion thinks. Um... Anyway, uh, so uh, the wolves are coming to war, uh, and uh, Sir Gregor is leaving the is leading the vanguard, mounted on the biggest horse that Tyrion had ever seen. And you would need a large horse if you're going to carry Sir Gregor upon your back. Um, and uh, and uh, Clegane, unlike Tywin, has no splendor about him. Uh, he is not resplendent. His armor is steel plate, dull gray, scarred by hard use. Gregor Glane is a pure fucking pragmatist. He doesn't give a shit about how he looks. All he wants to do is kill. And that is why Gregor Clegane is such a ter- terrifying person. Um, and he declares, if any, one man, if any man runs, I'll cut him down myself. He, he talks rather more in the books than he does in the show, I think. Of course, in the show, they've cast, I think, three different actors to play the mountain at various points. Um, yeah, indeed, Brandon Winslow, this is some rare mountain dialogue. Um, the mountain is actually talking here, and we don't get any of that in Game of Thrones Season 1, or not much of it anyway. Um, it's nice to see the mountain actually be a character instead of a set piece who kills people. Um, and so Gregor is commanding the vanguard and the plan is apparently to hold the river to the left. To the left of uh, their flank, there's this river and the idea is to prevent the Northmen getting past through that, uh, through that river. Um, and so Tyrion declares to the mountain clansmen, that river is ours, don't let anyone get past it, let's have a fucking war, mate, it's time to do a battle, it's time to do a fight, it's gonna be a tiff, it's gonna be a scrummage, it's gonna be a good time for all, except those who get murdered, which is gonna be about half of you. Medieval battle, the good old days, even better than the trenches, even better than the the modern fucking ICBMs, this is the way warfare used to be, back in my day. When we had Hello Rocks, uh, we we conducted warfare the only way which was appropriate, uh, which was the opposite of ancient Greek wrestling. Because you see, in ancient Greek wrestling, there were two rules. Uh, You could hit, you could punch, you could do whatever you like, but one, you could not bite, and two, you could not gouge eyes. Those were the two rules in ancient Greek wrestling. But back when I was a boy, back when I was a young, young, young ruffian growing up in in the 1760s, uh, that's that's BC, not AD. Back back in those days when I was a young and when I was fighting my fights, uh, we had the opposite rules of Greek wrestling. Back in my day, uh, our rules were that the only two appropriate moves in combat, the only honourable uh, procedure you could follow in war, uh, was to bite and to gouge. No other movements were, were considered appropriate. Uh, so, so man, we had a lot of blind people. We had a lot of people with bite marks. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, that's, 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 uh, that's... <laughs> Uh, it's it's a rough time, is all I'm trying to say. I, w- I don't want to go too much into those dark memories. Uh, but, uh, man, I'm glad they changed the rules on the Greek wrestling situation. I'm glad they've banned biting. Because war was... War never changes. <coughs> so they're going to do a war. They're going to do a battle. Uh, get ready to fight. 
uh, and and the armies are squaring up. Shagger has an axe in each hand, and he smashes them together and chants, Half man, half man, half man. Uh, and, uh, and we have a donation from Digital Hero. Thank you, Digital Hero. We will read your message at the end. Uh, and, um... And the and the Mountain Clansmen chant half man, half man, half man, which is kind of like those shitty high school movies at the end where everyone chants the name of the plucky, unremarkable, yet ultimately heroic, usually white male protagonist, and everyone's like, whoa, how exciting, you did the thing, and it's like a male uh, power fulfillment, uh, uh, indulgence sort of a thing. And of course that, again, I think feeds into Tyrion's feelings of insecurity, which are a focus of this chapter. Uh, he, he wants to be treated as a giant, he wants to feel important, and here his warriors are chanting his name half man i mean half man is in itself kind of a demeaning nickname but it also is a bunch of blokes chanting his name so i think Tyrion perhaps feels a certain pride uh in in his name being chanted although that's not quite acknowledged in the chat necessarily as such anyway um and so yeah his heart is pounding he's feeling sweaty um <laughs> there's vomit on his sweater already um, and, um, and Gregor and the mountain is up, and it looks like the battle is about to start, the armies are facing each other off, um, there's a bunch of, and, and remember, a medieval army, they're not all, like, night, yeah, wow, Space Potato says, Harry, you saved Hogwarts again, and Dumbledore does some ridiculous math to make sure that Gryffindor wins the House Cup as well, by some obviously, artificially, arbitrarily, or, like, com- it's... Gryffindor shouldn't win every time. It's bullshit. Dumbledore, you're a good bloke, but I'm going to call you out on your shit. You've been rigging the House Cup game for years because you want your favourite little Harry to get to do the cheer with the... Come on, mate. Stop rigging the game. Fake election. Fake news. Uh, Anyway, so... um, So, the the fight's about to start. Um, And... uh, and and the enemy is advancing them, and they're boiling over the hills, running at each other. Uh, and Tyrion's like, "Shit, man, this 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 feels threatening." Um, and um, and he recognizes some of the Northmen. So he sees Hornwood banners, Castark banners, Kerwin banners, Glover banners, Frey banners, and he wonders where Rob Stark himself is doesn't seem to see Rob Stark, almost as though he's not there. But anyway, too busy to worry about that, because there's fucking war horns coming, there are there are horns blowing, it's drums, are, it's like fucking drums in the deep, man, fucking boom, 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 like we got, actually, oh, I've got, I've got something for this, actually, so we need more, um, we need, we need, we need some energy, don't we, we need some battle music, uh, so I've got, uh, something that's uh, uh, well, not at all like that, really, actually, but let's play it anyway. Um, all right, you hear that? Combat, all right? Exciting, adrenaline-pumping <laughs> music is what we've got there. Four, 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 hand-to-hand combat. That's what's going on. You probably can't hear it very well, but what the fuck ever. So the battle is going to begin. The Northmen are breaking into a canter. Schiller, son of Shake, is out there. Shagger is howling. The clansmen are charging. Shit is going down. Man, there's a crescent of enemy spearmen. There's Castarks. There's Grigor Clegane. People are dying. There's spears. There's cavalry charging into a bunch of fucking shield walls. Like, it's like the fucking Battle of the Bastards, but, like, this is Season 1, so they didn't have a budget for anything like that. And again, like, we don't actually see this battle at all in Season 1 because of the complete lack of like a budget but anyway there's stuff going on there's a cacophony of swords there's a dozen men going down there's barbed spearheads and the horses are dying the horses get such a rough trot um and so there's like death throes of dying horses and there's people running around uh and and there's the mountain clansman and Tyrion like brings the people to him and they're like attacking and there's like a flight of arrows and people are dying beneath the arrows and there's a hedgehog not a literal hedgehog but a metaphorical hedgehog because there's a shield wall and there's spears and there's people cleaving swords and 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 there's a breast uh, i think that's like a breastplate and then there's a man at arms and he's dying and there's shit going on Whoa, it's so fucking intense there's chips of oak there's so many pages jesus christ the battle descriptions are ridiculous 
Tyrion kills some blokes, basically, which is maybe a bit in, uh, implausible given the whole dwarfism situation, but he's on horseback and he kills some people, uh, then he falls off his horse, uh, and, and there's this bloke who looks like he's about to kill Tyrion for a moment, uh, but then it doesn't, it doesn't quite happen, he sort of gets away, uh, and then, and then, uh, because this crazy thing happens, remember how Tyrion has a, a spike on his helmet, so this big enemy soldier knocks Tyrion down and looks like he's about to kill him, but Tyrion goes, oh, I yield, but when he sort of lurches upwards, his helmet, the spike on his helmet when he's on the ground, plunges through the belly of, of the horse of the knight who was threatening him, and so it killed the horse, the horse fell over, landed on the knight, which is kind of a ridiculous slapstick thing to happen, uh, but, but there's no time to dwell on it because the battle is happening, and then Tyrion's elbow gets hit with a morning star, and it hurts a lot, and it's unpleasant, uh, and, the, and, and there's injury, and there's blood, and there's shit going on, and Tyrion is just sort of staying ahead of the combat, and he's fighting implausibly again, but they keep fighting, it's so exciting, and then uh, they're, they're fighting, and they're circling, and then the battle sort of, um, the battle sort of passes by Tyrion. So I think that's enough for the battle music, uh, but, but, uh, but, uh, the battle, the worst of it has passed for Tyrion. Um, and so, uh, and so Bronn rides up to Tyrion, and so there's sort of a moment of calm, because the, the, the main sort of fighting bit of the battle has sort of moved on from where Tyrion is, and Tyrion's dismounted now, so he's sort of outside of the main part, uh, of the battle at this point. Um, and so they sort of go, huh, that, that sure was a battle, isn't it? And they watch as the remnants of the Stark lions get demolished by Tywin Lannister's reserves. So the battle goes in favour of the Lannisters. Uh, and so Tyrion surveys some of the sort of corpses uh, and, some, and some of the shit that's happened. Um, and so a bunch of the mountain clansmen are dead. Shagger is riddled with arrows. Although he seems to be okay, he pulls most of the arrows out. He seems to be more or less arrow-proof. Um, and yes, uh, as um, as Kerry Noir notes, uh, if Tyrion had a unicorn helmet, uh, he would be m much more efficient in his horse stabbing with his helmet, wouldn't he? So that's probably why Flemont Brax does it, isn't it? Flemont Brax, the unicorn that rides, he knows the fucking meta, man. He knows the moves in order to win this medieval combat shit. Uh, but anyway, the battle is kind of ending um, and there's a whole bunch of people dead, um, and, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and Shagger seems to be kind of alright. Uh, Shellishon of Shake is quite pleased because she's taken four ears, uh, from the people she's killed. Do you think that's two people from whom she's taken two ears each, or do you think that's four people from whom you've taken one ear each? Uh, does, does she only collect left ears, or only collect right ears, or only collect both? I mean, it'd be a bit greedy to take both, wouldn't it? Who knows? Anyway, uh, and so Timot is looting some corpses, having a good time with the other burned men, um, and it looks as though about half of the mountain clansmen have survived. Um, and Tywin, Tywin, meanwhile, while the battle is sort of wrapping up and most everyone is a corpse, uh, Lord Tywin is seated by the river, sipping wine from a jeweled cup. A fine victory, Sir Kevin said. So in amongst all this fucking awful blood and mud and screaming and pain, uh, we have Tywin Lannister sitting amongst it all, sipping wine from a jeweled cup, looking like a fucking aristocratic wanker am amidst all of the human suffering. Um, and then Tyrion walks up to Tywin and says, Hey, I'm still alive. <laughs> you wanted me to die, but I'm not dead. And Tywin just sort of goes, eh. Yeah, well, whatever. And Tywin actually admits that he kind of expected uh, Tyrion's part of the army to die. Tywin actually had a plan. Tywin actually had a plot. Tywin was actually planning some mischief, because Tywin's plan was for Tyrion's side of the army, because their job was to guard the river, remember. Tywin's plan was for Tyrion to break, and the mountain clansmen, the untrained, shitty mountain clansmen, to break, and for the Northmen to break through that part, and therefore for the Northmen to trap themselves between the river and the main force of Tywin's army, so then Tywin could swing around and flank them and fuck their shit up. Uh, but Tyrion did more of a good job than expected, uh, and uh, they actually did succeed in pr protecting the river, and Tyrion didn't die. But it didn't matter, because in the end the Lannisters won anyway. But the important point is that Tywin... Uh, uh, had a plan that endangered Tyrion, he chose not to tell Tyrion that plan. He didn't let Tyrion in on the plan, uh, which is a pretty uh, dick move from Tywin. Um, 
And, uh, and yeah, Tywin again insults and criticizes Tyrion by saying, you're a man who consorts with sellswords and savages, and that's why I can't trust you. Uh, so, yeah, he really is being unpleasant to his son. Uh, and then Tywin admits that, uh, uh, yeah, well, you know, looks like Rob Stark was a little bit more cautious than I thought he would be, because Tywin has previously dismissed Rob, saying, ah, it'll be easy, like, to beat up Rob. It's not going to be hard at all. Uh, but as it turns out, Rob didn't fall into Tywin's trap. Um, so, uh, so, uh, he looks as though he was wrong there. Uh, and then Tywin, uh, observes that Tyrion was wounded, because he did get a bit of a, get of a bump, he got a bit of a knock on his arm, nothing seriously problematic, but he did get crunched in the elbow, uh, which is not a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, and Tyrion says, yeah, I'd rather like some medical attention, unless you want a one-armed dwarf as your son, even worse than a, than a dwarf. Tyrion is always so passive-aggressive and sarcastic the way he talks to his ty- to his father. It's always a very sort of defensive, but at the same time, I think, rather weak way to speak. Anyway, um, and so, uh, and so Tywin's like, fine, go and get medical attention or whatever, but then Sir Adam Marbrand r- rides up, and delivers an assessment of what's going on with the battle and the situation. He says, yo, uh, the battle's over, and look, uh, <clears throat> I've got good news, uh, and I've got bad news. Here's the thing. The good news is that we're, we've beaten the Northmen who, who came. We've beaten Lord Kerwin and Willis Manderley and Harry and Carstark uh, and some Freys and Lord Hornwood. We've, we've beaten them. Um, Roose Bolton got away, unfortunately. Roose Bolton got away because, of course, side, sidebar, sidebar, Roose Bolton, of course, uh, was kind of happy to lead these Northmen into the meat grinder because his plan is to eventually betray Rob Stark at the Red Wedding and become Lord Paramount himself. So Rob Stark, ha- so Roose Bolton has his own bullshit going on right now. But anyway, so... So Adam Arbrand is like, well, the good news is that we beat these Northmen, but the bad news is, ah, Rob Stark isn't here. And in fact, most of his army wasn't here. Uh, we beat the Northmen, but only a very small number of the Northmen. Uh, most of the Northmen, the main army, with their leader Rob Stark, are riding the fuck over to River Run upon Jamie Lannister, who has no fucking idea that they're coming. So this might be... A little bit of a problem. And then Tyrion would have laughed if it hadn't hurt so much. And that is the conclusion of this chapter. So that was an interesting chapter, I think. We won't brood over long uh, on its meaning, I think, because this has been a rather long episode already. Uh, but uh, we got to see all sorts of unpleasant fucking uh, psychoanalytic shit going on between Tyrion and Tywin. There's really is a unpleasant, toxic relationship. And we introduced the relationship between Shay and Tyrion, another interesting relationship which ends on a sour note, shall we say. Tyrion ends up murdering both Tywin and Shay. Um, he, he doesn't really respond to these difficult relationships well, does he? It's not really what, what a counsellor or a psychologist would recommend, is it? When you have a troubled relationship with your father and with your girlfriend, should you murder them? Uh, probably not. Probably not. Look, uh, here at Alt Swift X, look, we're, we're always moralizing, aren't we? We're always saying, here's the way things should be, up from our ivory tower, saying, look, this is this is what everyone should do. We take a hard moral stance, a dramatic, radical moral stance. Here at Alt Swift X, we, st- we take the moral stance that you probably shouldn't kill people, generally. G- generally, just tr- try to reduce human suffering. That's, that maybe let's end with that message. Uh, but of course, we will first uh, respond to all of the comments and the questions that have come from uh, kind donors. Uh, so, Digital Hero has made a kind donation, and he has said, guys, check out the Game of Thrones bingo on the subreddit. There is indeed a uh, an alt Shrift X subreddit, and I believe Digital Hero is one of the main uh, people running uh, that place, uh, which is very kind of him, so, or him or her. Thank you to Digital Hero uh, for running Alt Shrift X subreddit, and if anyone wants to go check out that subreddit, go uh, go and have a look. Uh, Digital Hero is running some fun little activities there, I think. Uh, so it'd be cool uh, to breathe some life into the Alt Shrift X subreddit alongside the Facebook and the Discord, which are both also lovely places to be. So thank you 
Digital Hero. Uh, and we also have a donation uh, through Streamlabs uh, from Joe Job A. Uh, and so, by the way, yeah, so if you do want to make a donation, it is better to make it through the Streamlabs link, which is the first line of the description of the video. Uh, because if you do it through Super Chat, YouTube takes like 40% or something. Uh, so no big deal. But yeah, if you do choose to donate, it is better to do it through the link in the description. Uh, anyway, so uh, we got that donation from Jojo BA. And as far as I can see, there's no message that Jojo BA has included. Uh, I'm still working out the UI. Apologies if there is a, a message and I missed it. Uh, we'll We'll fix that later if that's the case. But thank you. Uh, Jojo BA for your donation. Uh, and so maybe we should have a quick little sort of super quick lightning round Q&A or something to finish off uh, this particular episode. Can someone chuck a Q to A? Uh, uh, something exciting. Uh, might as well mention future plans. So the goal ideally is to finish uh, Game of Thrones book one uh, in Game of Thrones Abridged Alt Drift X before Game of Thrones season seven starts. Uh, but we'll see what happens. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Um, but we'll do our darndest. Uh, and yes, that will mean some more sort of impromptu live streams when you least expect it. So keep an eye, look look to the west on, on the third day, uh, and Alt Shrift X will come riding in. Um, uh, there don't seem to be any particular cues to be aid, uh, so let's just end uh, this here. Uh, thank you all for participating in the live stream, and have a wonderful weekend. Cheers.